Hey, good morning, church. It is good to see you all online. And this is the first time for the band being able to get together. So we are really excited to be in one location, social distancing, and being able to uh, play together, worship together, lead lead you in worship together. But man, will you join in wherever you're at this morning? Join in. Let's just make much of Jesus today. Here we go. sing a new song that comes out of the Old Testament. It's about Moses when he was uh, being led by Jesus and being set free as he'd been walking the wilderness with the Israelites and they were being led out of captivity. And so just a beautiful song and a beautiful reminder that God is at work in the middle of our circumstances in our midst. As we lift this chorus together, tell him that he fights for us. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing this together. 
together. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus in my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah, you have chosen. morning, Bethel. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. We start a new series today called Deeper Healing. If you've ever been in pain, like you know there's a need for healing. Physical pain often reminds us that like we just want something to fix it. We want to be better and oftentimes we have a little physical pain and we go to the doctor and we get uh, some help and then, and then we feel better. Um, but the reality is that Physical pain isn't the only pain we experience. I mean, there's emotional pain. And while when you're really hurt, you can't hide it physically, oftentimes we try to hide emotional pain and spiritual pain. Like when we're just experiencing something in our spiritual life that doesn't seem to add up, 
we just wrestling, it, it hurts, and it hurts all the same. And oftentimes, it's the things people don't see about us that hurt. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about relational pain. We've all experienced relational pain. Maybe somebody bailed on you in your life. Maybe it had something to do with the way you behaved, but maybe it had something to do with who they were. But they bailed on you and they walked away when you needed them. And maybe, maybe you've had somebody stab you in the back and gossip about you. Maybe somebody who you thought was your friend proved to be your enemy. Maybe someone who was trying to love you but being broken somehow did something to break you. And those kind of pains are just as real as the physical pain. And it would be all fine and good to have some relational pain and adjust to the relational pain in our life, except sometimes relational pain can impact our walk of faith. For some of you, you choose not to follow Jesus because you've experienced relational pain and you decided that the relational pain you've experienced at the hands of other people or even at your own doing, maybe that relational pain meant that God wouldn't have a relationship with you. And relational pain can impact our walk of faith. There was this moment when Jesus began to talk about the importance of relationships. Now, Jesus does this in the context of teaching. And he's in front of the Sadducees, like the legal leaders of the day, and the Pharisees. And it says, hearing that Jesus had silenced them, the Pharisees and Sadducees got together. And one of them decides to trap Jesus by asking him a question. It says an expert in the law tested him with this question because if they tested him and he didn't give the answer they thought, they could just say, well, this guy's teaching is bogus. They ask him, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Well, these were men who were drastically in love with all the law God had given and a whole lot of more law that they had made. They loved the law. The law was how they made their living. The law was how they survived. The law was how they got respect. And they asked Jesus this question, trying to trip him into picking one so they could tell him he picked the wrong one. And Jesus, refusing to be hemmed in, not following the rules of religion, Jesus decides that even though these guys make the rules here, I'm going to give them two, not one. And Jesus replied confidently that the greatest commandment was to love your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind, that loving God was the greatest commandment, that ultimately, at the end of the day, the one that mattered most was to love God. He said, this is the first and greatest commandment, and then he gives a second one. And I don't know about you, but I like the idea of loving God, and I like the idea of God loving me, and I I find it difficult to see myself as lovable, but I like the idea of loving the most significant being in the entire universe. And I definitely love the idea of being on the good side and the good graces of the most powerful being in all the universe. And then Jesus throws a caveat to this verse. He says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Ooh. So I can't just have a relationship with the perfect God? And that perfect God choose to have a relationship with me? Jesus stipulates that you have to love your neighbor as yourself. That in order to love God, you actually have to love your neighbor too. And that the love of God will drive you to love your neighbor. You cannot follow Jesus And not love your neighbor, and I don't know about you. But loving people can sometimes be hard because I know some of them. You see, sometimes the relational pain that we experience from other people and the difficulty we find in loving our neighbors because of what they've done or how we perceive them or what relational pain we've experienced in our relationships with them can begin to distort our perspective of God and make us struggle to love God, too. A friend 
loves at all times, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17 says. It's a short little, wise little quip. It was coined by a guy named Solomon in the Old Testament. Jesus certainly would have known of this passage. It was one that was frequently used in his culture. It was one that these disciples uh, likely knew. When they took their fish to market to sell, uh, they would often have heard after the deal was over, as they were walking away, a friend loves at all times. It was a shrewd businessman who, after taxes, was taking his part and making his profit off of their fish. And they were actually struggling to make it. Most of these fishermen were being taxed so hard in this day and age that while this man would say, I'm a friend, a friend loves at all times after the deal as to somewhat reassure them to keep coming back, he was really sticking a knife in their back. And they knew this proverb really well. It was found frequently in Jewish documents. It was a, a phrase that had been intended well by Solomon generations before, but it had become twisted. What I love is that as we walk through this message, you're going to find that Jesus loves to take things that have been twisted and broken and flip them on their head. Jesus eventually uses the term friend to describe all of his disciples. But when Jesus says it, it isn't about a transitional, transactional deal that he has with these guys. It's really about the relationship that he really has with them. See, Jesus had met many of these disciples in interesting places. They weren't the guys that you thought would be following Jesus. I mean, they didn't have the golden resume that, for the most part, that said they deserved to follow him, that they were good enough, that they followed the rules well enough. Most of them had a history. I mean, you had, you had Matthew, who had been a tax collector. He was like the who's who of losers in that culture. He was one of the guys who probably, when he took taxes, probably said, a friend always loves. All the while, his people knew he was robbing them. And then there were these two brothers, these two fishermen, who were being taxed heavily by the Roman government. And then the middleman who was selling the fish was robbing them of their profits of their catch and would always say, a friend always loves. Sometimes our picture of love and what we've experienced from others can distort our view of God. So they follow Jesus, and they take off, and they follow him for three years. It's, it's an interesting time, but it's full of miracles. It's full of incredible events. I mean, Jesus heals people when they're short on food. Jesus, like, feeds, like, thousands of people. I mean, it, it's really convenient to follow him. It's a pretty good time. And Jesus seems to get to a deeper level with these guys. They lived life together. Like, these weren't just, like, Facebook friends where, oh, yeah, I know him. He's my Facebook friend. This was, oh, yeah, I know him. He can't eat too many beans at night before he goes to sleep kind of friends. These were the, he can't, uh, you know, Thomas, he doesn't really believe anybody kind of friends. They, they knew each other. They had walked with each other. Jesus knew them. He often appeared to know what they were thinking. But there's this night where um, they've come down into Jerusalem, and they've, they've done this before, and they're having the Passover dinner, and Jesus says some really interesting things for a Passover dinner, and he begins to tell them that some of the things they thought about him really aren't the case. And he tells them, this before he delivers the news, he tells them, I no longer call you servants. Like, see, in their day, when you followed a rabbi, you were kind of a servant of the rabbi. When the rabbi said, can you go do this? They went and did it. And they went and did it in exchange for the knowledge that the rabbi would teach them. But it's come to a point in which Jesus is going to die on the cross and raise from the dead. And Jesus is preparing them for that. And he says, I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. And what I think they heard was that phrase. What I think they would have recalled and remembered was the phrase that was used in nearly every aspect of their life relationally. Almost as a, 
phrase that you would use when you walked away from somebody after any transaction would be like, a friend always loves. And Jesus actually meant it. While the other people they had known may have not, while they may have had broken relationships in their past from walking away from whatever they were doing, while they may have experienced hurt and pain the same way that we had experienced pain, Jesus loved differently, and he calls them friends. He says, for everything I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. What he's saying here to these guys before he delivers them this awful news that they're going to run away from him is I'm always going to love you. I'm always going to love you. But don't you think they had heard that before? Don't you think at the tax collector's table, don't you think at at the fisherman's table when, when they brought the extra catch that they wouldn't consume and they got their payment that they had been told, I'll always love you. You're a friend, right? And using this twisted phrase in their culture, but when Jesus says it, he means it. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I hear God say that he'll always love me, I find it hard to believe. You know why? Because sometimes I don't love me. And sometimes I've experienced people that said they would always love me, not love me. And sometimes I've had people say, we'll always be good friends. And they disappear. And I think much like us, that the disciples heard this from Jesus. And that those powerful words had lost meaning because of the events of relationship. And Jesus is telling them, I'm always going to love you, but I don't think they bought it. He says, I'm going to get arrested and you're going to run away. I'm always going to love you, but you're going to bail on me. Now, I don't know about you, but if you bail on people, they will often find it hard to love you. And maybe one of the reasons that you find it hard to love God is that your view of love is thwarted by people who said they loved you but walked away from you. Maybe they walked away from you when you weren't what they thought you should be. Maybe they walked away from you because they weren't something they needed to be. But Jesus is telling them, I'll always love you. In church, over and over and over, one of the things we teach our children here is God loves you. We teach them three key facts. God loves you, God made you, and God wants to be your friend. One of the reasons that it's so important for a child to know that God loves them is that God's love will propel them to the life he made them for. But if we've gone through experiences, and as we go through experiences, it's really easy to sing songs like, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. But inwardly, something has been twisted. And I believe the same way that Jesus wanted to redeem this phrase, he wants to redeem our belief in his love for us so much that these guys actually did exactly what Jesus told them they would do. It says, but all this has taken place and the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. That Jesus knew they were going to desert him and flee, and he still told them prior to this that he would always love them. You know, there are reasons why we run away from God. And these guys, it says, They deserted him and fled. You ever run from a mad dog? I mean, you can find super human speed when you're being chased by something mean. I don't know if they thought that that Jesus, that, that people would be mad at them, but I know the Roman government wouldn't have been happy with them. Maybe they thought they would get Jesus's punishment too. And it says they deserted him and they fled. They ran. There are reasons why we run away from God. You know, in our church, uh, when staff is all in the building, um, in one way it's safe because we all kind of have each other's back. We all look out for each other. We all look out for the people who are in our church. But in another way, it's never safe. We love 
to scare each other. Now, everybody knows that when you scare me, you have to do it from a distance because I might come up swinging. But they will, they will literally wait in a stairwell to jump out at you. And um, the temptation when we're scared is to run. There are reasons why we run away from God. I think the first is that we're often afraid. I mean, maybe you run from God because you've known some of God's people that didn't love the way God says he loves. Maybe for some of you, it's been easier to watch church for these last couple months than it is to go to church because you're afraid of getting hurt again. Maybe we're afraid because continuing the same way could cost me something. And these disciples knew they could die if they continued to love God, to love Jesus. Sometimes we run because of convenience, because it's the easier thing to do. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you felt like it would be easier to run away than deal with the fallout of what had happened. Like you had messed up so bad that it didn't seem worth the energy and you didn't think you could redeem it anyway. I mean, it had been fun for these guys to follow Jesus when they were at the table eating full meals. It had been fun to follow Jesus when uh, crippled men learned to walk and blind men began to learn to see. It, it, it was fun to follow Jesus when there was a rock star crowd around who was just wanting to get a piece of you, to know you, because you knew this Jesus who was a healer. It was convenient for many of us. It's convenient for us to say we love God on Sunday, but not to experience the fullness of a loving relationship with God the rest of the time. And look, if this is where you're at, I'm not judging you. If you've run from God because you're afraid, I get it. If you've run from God because it was convenient, I understand. Because sometimes the places God calls us into aren't easy to walk into. And it's really easy for us to lose faith in him because of the lost faith we've had in others. Third reason we often run from God is disappointment. We had an idea about how things were going to go and they didn't go that way and the, fan, the plans fell apart. Disappointment. We can be sure that maybe, maybe we think that God hasn't lived up to his part of the bargain and it's somehow twisted our relationship with him. It's, it's put a gap between us and maybe God is still doing a thing while we're waiting on him to do the thing and we feel disappointed and let down. You ever been disappointed in God? I mean, the cool thing is you're in your house. You can probably raise your hand in your house. You're not in a room of 500 people. You're under no pressure for people to think that you have it all together, right? But have you ever felt disappointed in God? I mean, we've all experienced disappointment. We've all experienced times where we thought it was going to go one way and it went another. And I think these guys had felt that. Afterward, it, it's, there's a story, and I love, I love that despite what has happened here, there's an afterward story. Because in many of our relationships, when we mess up bad enough, when we screw up and walk, run away far enough, when we uh, get away from it far enough that like, our, they don't ch people don't chase us in a relationship anymore, so we somehow think that if we run from God, that it'll leave us alone. Maybe that's your story. Maybe you know God called you to something, but you experienced a little hurt and a little sadness along the way, a little disappointment, or it was inconvenient, and you just decided to run, but it just won't let go of you. And here's some good news, that in this story in the book of John, after Jesus' death and resurrection, it says Jesus appeared again to his disciples. You know what? His disciples don't come to him begging for forgiveness. I don't know if they didn't think it was possible or if they just had thought Jesus' phrase of calling them friend didn't mean any more than the tax collector or the fishmonger. But Jesus finds them 
See, what's crazy, he finds them by the Sea of Galilee. That's a seven-day walk. These men had traveled for nearly a week. And you know, a lot of these men had came from around the Sea of Galilee. What's interesting is that they had began to go back to what they knew before. Jesus is willing to come after you in order to have a relationship with you and love you as a real friend. He's willing to come to where you are. For so long, the American church has said, come and be like us and you can be one of us. But Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you who you need to be. Jesus wants to do a transforming work in us while we're still broken. And for some of us, our relationship, our pain in our relationship with him is so heavy and we believe God won't come chase me down. And for some of you, this is the moment where God reaches out to you and says, you haven't gone too far. I know you've been running. It says, Simon Peter, the overzealous disciple, Thomas, the doubter, Nathaniel, the guy with a great name. That's my name. The sons of Zebedee, like these two brothers that were always overzealous and fired up, and two other disciples. They're all together. I don't know if they went together because uh, they were trying to stay with Peter who had gone back to fish, or if they just actually were trying to love Peter while he was running, or if they were just like, you know what? These are the dudes I roll with, so we're going to roll. If we're going to run, let's run together. Simon Peter tells him, we're, I'm going to go out and fish. That's what he had done before, and they just said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. I don't need to tell many of you, if you're running from God, you know that it's pretty fruitless. That somehow the thing that you often try to escape relationally eventually catches up to you again unless God puts his hand in it and begins to heal it. And early in the morning, they had just gone through a dark night on the water, and it says, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. Now, Speakers, preachers, theologians have all really wrestled with why they didn't recognize Jesus. I mean, did Jesus have like a new Travis Tripp mullet, a Joe Dirt mullet, and you know, he's, you know, business in the front, party in the back? Did he have the Trans Am mullet and they didn't recognize him from his old haircut? Did did Jesus' beating on the cross have such an impact to his appearance they didn't recognize him? And they, they've wrestled with this. There have been books written on this. And, and for some reason, it just seems really obvious to me. I mean, if you've been running hard away from Jesus, the last person you expect to see is Jesus. If you've run hard from relationships in the past and people have given up on you and walked away from you, then you have a hard time imagining a God who would chase after you a God who would find you running away from him, that Jesus was willing to take a seven-day trip to reestablish a relationship with him. I want you to know you have not gone too far. You have not messed up too bad. You have not walked away a distance that God cannot reach. Your pain is not so deep and so deeply cut that God can't heal it. Because when God heals it, the way you'll love him will be changed and the way you'll love your neighbors, your family, and your friends will be changed. And Jesus comes to them and he reestablishes a relationship. And what I love is what happens in that, in that passage in verse five, in chapter 21 of John, verse five, it says that Jesus' response as he's come to them is he calls out to them. You traitors, you backstabbers, you no good doing, lying, stealing crooks. That's not what he said at all. Might be what they expected. You know what's interesting? Jesus doesn't call them what they thought they were. He doesn't call them by their disappointment. He doesn't call them by their failures. He calls them friend. 
because that's what love does. And he asked him a question, friends, do you have any fish? But the question wasn't really the question. The name he called them was the point. That while he knew what they were going to do, that night in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 15, when he said, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. That he meant it like Solomon intended, not like people had twisted. Instead, he said, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. What he was saying was, I will always love you. Oh, when you mess up in the past, loved you then. When you're messing up in the present, love you. When you mess up in the future, I'll always love you. I see people get caught in all these places. They let their past define who they think they are and therefore keep them from talking to God because surely God doesn't want anything to do with them. They let what they're doing right now keep them from reaching out to God in relationship. And because of that, they get stuck. You can be screwed up, messed up, broken up, tore up, and tore down, and you can reach out to God. Jesus came to Matthew in the middle of his sinful behavior as a tax collector. He met the woman at the well who was caught up in adul adultery. And he finds these men on a beach running back to what they had done before. Looking to a future without him. And he brought them back into relationship with him. What he's saying is, I knew what you would do, and I never stopped loving you. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you've been running. You are run so far that you're exhausted. Even when you're running from the dog, eventually you give up. Maybe today's the day where you just stop and say, all right, I've got to confront this in the presence of God. And maybe you believe that God wants to confront you and punish you and beat you up and beat you down like some of the people in your life. But I believe he wants to call you friend. See, I don't know where you are right now, but I know where he is. And here's what I know. When real people, people like you, people like me, When we encounter Jesus, we'll experience change. Friends, our culture has got to be better at loving each other. Because that's what it means to love God. And we've got to get better. And I don't believe that the answer is better performance. I believe it's about a better relationship with God where we're grounded in the fact that my past is paid for, my presence is dealt with, my future is covered, and I'm a friend of God. And because I live in that confidence, I can walk into inconvenient, fearful situations and love anyway because my friends fear. Friends always love. Maybe today's the day where you allow God to begin to rewrite your idea of what fear is. Maybe today's the day where you recognize that God didn't call you to just be a servant who he puts his thumb down on all the time. But maybe he wants to be your friend. You know what happened to these guys? Over the next few years of their lives, they followed Jesus, even though Jesus ascended into heaven with God, Jesus' love propelled them forward to love the people they came in contact with. 
to love them so much that they didn't worry as much about their convenience, to love them so much to be willing to give of themselves so that other people could know a love that is always a friend. This morning, if you want a relationship with Jesus and you've been running, just stop. He's calling your name, and your name is his friend. This morning, if you've been running from God for a while, but just doing the religious thing, God has so much more for you than a twisted version of friendship that is based upon your performance. He offers transformation, and it's as simple as admitting that you don't have it all together, believing that he died on the cross, rose from the dead, and is present in you with you as your friend to propel you forward to go out into the world and share with the world the greatest news that's ever told not a love that stabs in the back but a love that never gives up never walks away will you follow him that invitation is open to you i know we're not in a religious environment and there's no altar call here where we sing a perfect song and everybody comes down the aisle I don't know that that's what God is always after anyway. I think he's after your heart. I love you, Bethel. Will you bow your heads in prayer? God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for being our friend. A friend who always loves. God, I pray that we would refuse to allow our relational experiences with others to distort our relationship with you, that you will give us a real encounter with the real you and begin to do a work in us, God, so that in the culture where we live, where people are hurting and wounded and broken and divided, that we can chase after people with incredible love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What a great message and a great word. It's uh, such a great reminder we get now to respond about the freedom that we find in Christ and that we're free because he has set us free. So let's lift this to him in response. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given
darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Thanks so much for watching. Are you ready to take your next step? We would love to hear from you. You can send an email to hello at Bethel.us. You can send us a message on Facebook, or you can let us know in the Bethel app. And speaking of the Bethel app, take a moment if you haven't already to go to your app store and search Bethel Putco to download our app. There's all kinds of great resources in the app. You can listen to messages. You can view the messages from Sunday morning. And you can also fill out a digital connect card. You can do that today and each week to let us know that you're tuning in. You can also find some great information about our Bethel Kids Ministry and our Be The One Student Ministries. Also in the app, you can give. It's one of three ways you can give. With online giving at Bethel.us slash give in our app, Bethel Putco, or through text. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great day and know that you are loved.